Oh, is that bag's on fire? Yeah. It's that blue Police have attended. We now assess that this was a detonation of an improv improvised explosive device. As you'll have seen, the reports of 18 injuries, and I understand most of those to be flash burns. <coughs> Suddenly I heard a big bang and I turned left and I saw the fireball surge toward my side. I see people jumping over, over like the, at the, at the train station, the, the top part, jumping down into the stairs, jumping into other people. It's kind of frightening and scary. I mean, right now I just can't believe it. You know, thinking to myself, Parsons Green on a Friday morning, you would think of such things happening on like maybe Oxford Street. Finally, in terms of the police response, I would emphasise that Londoners particularly can expect to see an enhanced police presence, particularly across the transport system, across the day. Well, we can see it at the far end of the train. I don't what? know what it was. It looked like a fireball. Hey, what? Was... What? An Alison Barry, defence specialist, riding in a nearby car, uh, a nearby train rather, at the time of that attack. And good to know that you are okay. What did you see and hear, Alison? Well, as a terrorism expert, you don't really expect to be in a major mm. terrorism incident, Bill. Uh, it, was, it was something to be seen for sure. One thing I do want to mention is the emergency uh, services were absolutely outstanding. They literally rely, uh, arrived instantaneously. So I was very impressed with that. And I would say the Londoners did, for the most part, remain very calm, cool, and collected. The train stopped. The doors opened. We all left as quickly as we could. But, you know, it is during rush hour, Bill, so the trains get very, very, very packed. Mm, so you can imagine it was a very yeah. crushed, tense situation. W were you below ground or above ground at that point, Allison? I was above ground. Okay. And so was the train that was hit, correct? Uh, yes, yes, it was. Uh, uh, the did, district line runs, uh, as you correctly said, outside and underground. Yeah. Did even you it's see any of the injured there? Burn marks are I did. what is explained to us. Go ahead. I did. I wasn't sure what was going on. I, I assumed, I think we all did, uh, when the train stopped. As Londoners, you get very used to these security alerts where the transport does stop. We're very trained in that here in London. So I think we all assumed that it was just another false alarm. Uh, and then it became very quickly clear that there was a serious incident. You could tell uh, police immediately started arriving on the scene, were encouraging us to leave. Uh, what I did see was uh, a lot of small children. There was a, a small boy who it looked like he'd been crushed, Bill. I'm not sure if that was in the actual incident itself or whether it was uh, sort of the rushing up the stairs, you know, with lots of larger people. Because it's not just commuting hour. This is an hour when lots of school children, you know, those uh, sort of Harry Potter school uniforms, that is what children wear here. So there was lots of small children in school uniforms on that train. Uh, so I saw a lot of children who were attended, but you know, very frightening to be an adult, let alone a child in a situation You're like that. You're painting a, a, quite an image for us. As a terrorism analyst now, terrorism expert as you described mm -hmm. yourself, five attacks sure. in England in the past year. What, what is the sense right. on behalf of the people there? Well, I'm glad you brought this up because we do see a lot of commentators uh, throughout the world saying that this has been uh, perhaps a spike. And I see this more as a shift, and I think that's the term that we like to use over here. It, rather than a spike of recent incidents, we're looking at a shift and a pattern, a trajectory where we will be seeing more. Uh, as horrible as that sounds, you know, I, I say that not to encourage alarm, but to encourage people to be alert and vigilant and cautious. Uh, because, uh, you know, one of the things we are looking at right now and uh, everyone's working very hard on is, is this an isolated incident? You know, we don't know. Perhaps you have more information lately than I do, Bill, but okay. we don't know definitely it's terrorism, right? We have had uh, they, they, past they incidents. It that way. Yeah. 
Uh, they have? The, okay, the definitely good. Has, yeah, okay, so if, uh, we have had instances in the past where it hasn't been. Um, it's just been people with, um, some say, mental disturbances. Okay. But if it is terrorism, then we do need to be concerned that this could be part of a larger network. And of course, further strikes could happen here in London, but also elsewhere. No question. Uh, you're, so you're, everyone's working very hard to, of course, yeah. ID those. I do the perpetrators and figure out if there's a network. You're a terrific guest, and I'm glad to see that you're okay. Oh, thank you. Allison, thank you. Thank Allison you, Barbie, and I would it's there in London. Thank you. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live from Los Angeles, California with James Jacob Prash. This is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, and wonderful to be with you here from sunny California. Sad day, however. Working up to the news that in London, where I reside part of the time, there's been another Islamic, almost certainly Islamic terrorist attack, this time on a tube train, a subway train, near where I used to live, actually, not far from where I lived at one time, uh, when I attended a Baptist church in London, and where we lived when I was in seminary. And uh, when you see neighborhoods, you know, getting struck, it's, it's quite horrible. This happened to me, of course, with the World Trade Center in, in Manhattan, where I lost a relative. It's happened to me in Jerusalem, Israel. It's happened in London. Places that were familiar to me. Places where there's people I know. Uh, it's never pleasant, but it's the reality. So much of reality that London, a city who elected a Muslim mayor, said, such terrorist attacks are now just part and parcel of living in a major city. An Islamic mayor saying, Putting up with Muslim terrorist attacks is just part and parcel of normalcy. Because recently said that the terror attacks are part and parcel now for big cities. Former UK Independence Party leader Nigel Farage says that kind of thinking is a mistake. In other words, what he is saying, Nigel, is that uh, uh, you got to deal with it. It's just it's just life in big cities. Uh, what did you make of that and the message it sends? Well, I think there's a bit of a trend here because just two days after that horrendous lorry attack that took place in Nice back on July the 14th. Two days afterwards, the French Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, said that this is a part of life in modern-day France. So Valls says it in Nice. Uh, Sadiq Khan says that it applies to big cities. I mean, you may as well just put up the white flag of surrender uh, to say, well, you know, we're just going to normalise terrorism. And what makes me really annoyed is it's the very same political class who have, whenever anybody has questioned open door Im immigration, whenever anybody says, look, surely we should security check people, we should make sure that newcomers into our country agree with our values, gets condemned. And what I'd like to see from the French Prime Minister and from Sadiq Khan, before they say anything, is an apology for what their policies and their ideas have done to all of us. But Nigel, this does seem to be a, a, a growing sentiment among political leaders who say, yeah. uh, we acknowledge terror and the threat, but don't make too big a deal of it. John Kerry, our Secretary of State, recently saying that he wished the media wouldn't constantly cover it, words to that effect. Uh, we've even, uh, you know, heard uh, those who are on the other side of the aisle, uh, you know, including first Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge saying more people are killed in, in car crashes and all that than, than what happened with terrorists all true but I think they minimize the threat when they minimize the numbers and compare them to other numbers uh, what do you think well that's right and I mean Bill de Blasio you know is still in denial it seems to me about what happened in New York last week every time we get one of these horrendous incidents uh, more in Europe than America but wherever they take place you know, immediately this same clique of people rush to say, of course, it's got nothing to do with terror. It's certainly got nothing to do with religion. Uh, you know, this is just kind of, just get on with it, guys. This is part of our everyday life. And they're in denial. Uh, they cannot admit to the people the extent of their failure. And they don't want to have an open, honest debate about how we deal with this. All right. Now, an open, honest debate, Donald Trump says, would be to recognize a war on terror, a, an actual war. He has said if he became president, he'd get a plan from his top generals within 30 days to take out ISIS once and for all. Uh, is that even possible now, given the fact that ISIS and these other terror groups seem so widespread, they almost don't need a homeland. They're everywhere. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, the fact that Trump you know, is talking about borders, is talking about security, is saying 
uh, that the US government has a responsibility to its own citizens, all of that is absolutely right and I think may well win him this presidential election. But when it comes to taking out ISIS, that's not so simple. Uh, you know, there isn't just sort of one command center. In fact, in many ways, ISIS is a little bit like the multi... Well, in the Muslim world, it is normalcy. But thanks to the British left, thanks to the British government, who continually panders to Islamic oil money, thanks to mainstream media, it's now commonplace in London. And if the political left have their way, as they've been having their way, including judges with an agenda, it'll be commonplace in the United States to the degree more than it already is. This is simply the reality. Again, a horrible attack, 22 people hurt. Fortunately, the bomb did not explode in the manner it was intended to, but the terrorists may have better luck next time. How we can allow judges to sit on benches and legislate from the bench unconstitutionally, interfering with elected officials, trying to protect the public, is the product of a socially diseased mind. How we can allow mainstream media to continue to feed people the lie that there's peace and tolerance coming from the Islamic culture when there obviously and factually and historically is not. Not to say that all Muslims are, of course, terrorists. How we can be expected to believe these lies? A simple walk through some of the premier neighborhoods in London, once again, will disclose that they're being colonized by Islam courtesy of a government prepared to sell Britain down the river to Muslim oil money, much the same as the Bush dynasty, the Clinton dynasty, Barack Obama and others have done in the United States. Quite frightening. I'm not trying to politically editorialize, but this remains the reality. The biggest victims numerically of Islamic terror are other Muslims, but their target is the infidel and their ultimate target is the United States and Israel. They've said this. They openly say it. Unfortunately, they have friends in Washington. They have friends in Whitehall. They have friends in the British Parliament. They have friends in the mainstream media. They have friends in the court systems. How can you elect an Islamic mayor who would say something like that? Well, you get what you vote for. You reap what you sow. It's happened again, and it will not stop unless the governments of the Western world realize that what Israel has been fighting for years and decades is what the West is going to be up against now. As Western governments continue to pander to, pander to their radical Islamic agenda, hypercritical of Israel, well, they're reaping the very thing that they've sowed. Again, we've pointed to Obadiah, verse 15, multiple times. This week in prophecy, we're forced, unfortunately and painfully, to point to it again. Thank God no one was killed, but they could have been. And the next time, they may well be. Wars and rumors of wars. North Korea fires an intermediate range ICBM into the mid-Pacific over Japan once again. Done with the de facto collusion of the Chinese government and done with the de facto approval of Mr. Putin and the Russian government. We've been held hostage by North Korea ever since Harry Truman fired Douglas MacArthur. I pointed this out. One successive American administration after the other has proverbially kicked the can down the road, as we've been told repeatedly. This includes Republicans such as Richard Nixon, who took a soft stance on the Pueblo affair. This includes the Bush administration, but above all, it was the incompetence of Jimmy Carter, who negotiated a $5 billion aid package to North Korea, building them a nuclear reactor. This was Carter. I've had some excerpts given to me by your office. Let me talk about some of the issues. One is North Korea. And you say that you, as president, would be willing to launch a preemptive strike against North Korea's nuclear capability. First, I'd negotiate. 
I would negotiate like crazy, and I'd make sure that we tried to get the best deal possible. But look, Tim, if a man walks up to you in a street in Washington, because this doesn't happen, of course, in New York, but if a man walks up and puts a gun to your head and says, give me your money, wouldn't you rather know where he's coming from before he had the gun in his hand? And these people, in three or four years, are going to be having nuclear weapons. They're going to have those weapons pointed all over the world, and specifically at the United States. And wouldn't you be better off solving this really potentially unbelievable, and the biggest problem, I mean, we can talk about the economy, we can talk about social security. The biggest problem this world has is nuclear proliferation. And we have a country out there in North Korea, which is sort of wacko, which is not a, dumb, not a bunch of dummies, and they are going out and they are developing nuclear weapons. And they're not doing it because they're having fun doing it, they're doing it for a reason. And wouldn't it be good to sit down and really negotiate something, and ideally negotiate? Now, if that negotiation doesn't work, you better solve the problem now than solve it later, Tim. And you know it, and every politician knows it, and nobody wants to talk about it. Jimmy Carter, who I really like, I mean, he went over there, it was so soft. These people are laughing at us. The former general of the Air Force, Merrill McPeak, the former Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, said you could not launch a preemptive strike against North Korea because the nuclear fallout could be devastating to the Asian Peninsula. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about us using nuclear weapons. I'm saying that they have areas where they're developing missiles. No, but taking out their nuclear do you know that this country would create Tim, a fallout. Tim, do you know that this country went out and gave them nuclear reactors? free fuel for 10 years. We, we virtually tried to bribe them into stopping and they're continuing to do what they're doing and they're laughing at us. They think we're a bunch of dummies. I'm saying that we have to do something to stop. But if the military Ideally, told you, Mr. Trump, we can't do you this. Give me two names. You're giving me two names. I don't know. Do you want to do it in five years when they have warheads all over the place, every one of them pointing to New York City, to Washington and every one of our... Is that when you want to do it? Or do you want to do something now? You better do it now. This was certainly above all and worst of all the obama administration clinton being nearly as bad well how much further can you kick the can down the road where there's no more road wars and rumors of wars something has got to give sooner or later the notion that there can be a negotiated settlement or some peaceful resolution or economic pressures or boycotts are going to work or embargoes is absolute nonsense. They will not. Whether there can be a targeted assassination of this madman or whether we have to bite the bullet and realize conflict is inevitable. Something has to happen. Japan is now at risk, not just Seoul, Korea, and with nuclear-tipped missiles that will soon be capable of hitting Hawaii, as well as Guam, where they can already target, and then the west coast of the United States, how much longer are we going to pander to left-wing politicians and stupid people who say stupid things? One of the most absurd things I saw was the lesbian, supposedly comedian, Rosie O'Donnell, mocking Donald Trump's hardline, or apparently hardline, response to North Korea. Again, these people are out of their minds out of their mind. Best not make any more threats to the United States. Now I know everybody probably called their doctor and tried to get Xanax, or maybe you cracked open a bottle of wine. Maybe you're eating a whole German chocolate cake. I understand. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Okay, well that was some crazy, crazy comments he just gave. Fire and fury and power. <laughs> no, Donald. Mueller's going to get you. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And just remember, he said he was going to sue me lots of times and he never did. Said he was going to take my wife. He didn't. Said he was going to take all my money and kick me in my fat face. Nothing happened. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power the likes of which this world has never seen before. Thank you. Thank you. This Week in Prophecy, reverting where we usually begin, Israel. Mr. Netanyahu, in a preliminary Rosh Hashanah celebration, did a political briefing in association with the New Year festivities for the Jewish New Year coming up next week. 
In it, there were a number of American and Israeli dignitaries, including Israeli Ambassador Ron uh, Dermar. Mr. Netanyahu highlighted two red lines where Israel will not be able to compromise and will be forced to launch air attacks on a massive scale if necessary. The first of these is Iran establishing a beachhead in Syria that will threaten Israel's existence. The second is Iran being allowed to establish a beachhead in Lebanon in collaboration with Hezbollah. Mr. Netanyahu declared directly that Israel will not allow this to happen and will unleash its air power in order to prevent it. And he will do so, obviously, no matter who agrees and who doesn't. Yet, of course, the left-wing media will call him the war hawk, not the Iranians. Let us continue this week in prophecy. In Pennsylvania, <clears throat> the branch of the Islamic charity, the Islamic Circle of North America, has been holding a series of meetings. This organization has funded all kinds of events with speakers from the radical Islamic <coughs> access of not only pro-Sharia, but pro-Jihadist rhetoric against the West and against Israel, including statements that are directly anti-Semitic made by their featured speakers. Among other things, they have said that the bombing of the American embassies in Kenya and the attack on the USS Cole were diversions of the United States to draw media attention away from the Clinton administration scandals with Monica Lewinsky. Therefore, we blow up our own embassies and kill our own diplomats. Yet this organization, the Islamic Circle of North America, is allowed to fund such speakers and bring them into the United States. It's an unbelievable situation. The statements they've made are frightening. But what's most remarkable about this organization is it has its roots when the United States took Islamic refugees from Bangladesh. These Islamic refugees from Bangladesh came when Muslim was killing Muslim. That is, Pakistan was trying to prevent East Pakistan from becoming an independent nation, which today we call Bangladesh as in the famous concert of Bangladesh by George Harrison of the Beatles, and so forth. Islamic refugees were taken into the United States as a gesture of humanitarian goodwill by America. Yet, this was the origin of the Islamic Circle of North America, spewing forth hatred of America, Jew hatred, and Islamic radicalism, and its support for Hamas, a terrorist organization. How long will the American government continue to allow these organizations to exist instead of closing them down as essentially anti-American enterprises? Controlled by foreign interests, or at least in league with foreign interests hostile to America. We wouldn't allow pro-Nazi organizations to operate in the United States on American soil during the Second World War and fundamentalist Islamic organizations should not be allowed to function or allowed to exist in America or the West now. This week in prophecy. Well, the situation in Jordan continues to gain a negative momentum. There may now be close to one and a half million Syrian refugees in Jordan already possibly the fourth, certainly the fifth poorest country in the Arab world. It does not have oil resources. It is not a wealthy country. It has an unemployment rate that is, by some calculations, 75%, although it is partially ameliorated by international aid, much of it from the United States, and by part-time employment. Demographically and geographically, Jordan is the Palestinian state that's been admitted by Yasser Arafat and the late King Hussein of Jordan 
at least 70 to 75 percent of the Jordanian population are Palestinian Arabs. But it is now swelling with these refugees from Syria that are having a destabilizing effect. Not only that, but there is a fear because of Iranian influence in Iraq that is mounting a undercurrent. The fears of the regime of King Abdullah II are that an instability is being generated by Iranian influence in neighboring Syria and Iraq. This continues to pose a threat, but there is another dimension not being widely supported this week in prophecy by the Western media. We will address it for what it is. Once again, it is Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. Jordan has taken the side of Islamic militants on the recent demonstrations and closures of the Temple Mount. Again, if Jordan is going to pander to radical Islam, Jordan is going to reap the repercussions of that pandering. It has damaged its relations with Israel, despite the goodwill of Israel, in order to support the Al-Aqsa <coughs> rioters in Jerusalem. Well, if that's what it wants to do, it's going to have to deal with the same problem itself. I have no doubt that what is taking place in Jordan is divinely orchestrated repercussion based on Genesis 12, 1 to 3. King Abdullah cannot have it both ways. He cannot walk the tightrope in both directions simultaneously. Either he wants good relations with Israel or he's going to pander to the militants. But simultaneously, he cannot do both. Jordan's situation is becoming increasingly precarious. And as that continues to deteriorate, as we've seen in this past week, it may create the kind of situation, once again, as we pointed out, that will lead to the unfulfilled prophecies of the destruction of Amman, when Israel will be forced to act in self-defense, if these Islamists get control of Jordan. These developments are not good. We are approaching September 23rd. The question becomes, what will happen on September 24th? The great eclipse taking place three weeks ago amounted to nothing of any global significance in terms of world events the following day or the day it happened. We've already seen the crackpot ramifications of crackpots, such as the late Harold Camping and such as Mark Biltz. It says in Genesis 1.14, God declares that he is creating the sun and the moon for signs and for seasons and for days and years. But the word signs is in there. The sun and the moon were created in the stars. And we're about to see the heavens declare. Well, Luke 21, 25, Jesus says there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. <laughs> and what do we have? We have solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, and the Revelation 12 sign in the heavens. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. The, the events that have happened since the blood moons, could we just kind of name some of them? Well, uh, you did have a war in Israel uh, during the, uh, the month of Av. As a matter of fact, I flew all the way to Israel on the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av, uh, with a group of pastors to comfort Israel during that time. Uh, but you saw a war in Israel. You see all these terrorist attacks. You see uh -huh. the rise of ISIS. Uh, you see uh, natural disasters, all kinds of things. But to me, the main thing of the blood moons was God wants his church to repent, just like you're talking about. What I thought was fascinating, I saw this in the news the other day. You can Google this. They say the exact path of the solar lunar eclipse, or solar eclipse, I mean, the, the exact path of the solar eclipse across the United States voted 95% for Trump. And the fascinating thing to me is God is not interested so much in the heathen to repent as much as he wants the church to repent. Right. 
okay? Judgment always begins with the house of God. And uh, I believe God, it, it's a warning that, that we need to take the lead. As believers, God is telling us it starts first with us and we need to repent. And it so uh, happens, uh, does anyone know when that eclipse is falling on the biblical calendar? This is why you need no. God's day timer. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon, okay? And Israel was to base their calendar on the new moon. Well, it so happens we're about to enter the month of Elul, and the month of Elul is known as the month of repentance. It was on Elul 1 that Jonah left for 40 days to tell Nineveh to repent. It was on Elul 1 that Moses went up to Mount Sinai after the sin of the golden calf trying to make atonement while Israel was repenting for that. It was on Elul 1 that Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days coming back out on Yom Kippur. Elul 1 is the month of repentance and to have this solar eclipse happening at this time, uh, it is huge significance, which we will get into more later. I can't wait. I want to know what do you think this means? This is strange. Well, I think it, basically it means that we as a church, we have 40 days to really repent. Just like, uh, you know, Abraham, he was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, trying to find at least 10 righteous. I don't know how many righteous is needed for America, but I, I believe, and this is what uh, they're taught in Judaism from even 2,000 years ago. I have books from 2,000 years ago and what they taught. And they said because the, uh, the Gentiles go by the sun for their calendar, a solar eclipse represents judgment coming upon a nation. A lunar eclipse, because Israel goes by the moon, refers to judgment coming upon Israel. Okay, or to repent, you know, they need to repent. And so this, uh, one thing, uh, I'll go ahead and mention it now. Go, yeah, do. Uh, many people don't realize this, but World War I started in uh, August of 1914, and there was a total solar eclipse over Eastern Europe and the Ottoman Empire. And what happens? You have this total solar eclipse, beginning of World War I, and the Ottoman Empire is destroyed. It even went over Nineveh, the same place mm -hmm. as where Jonah was. And most wow. people don't even know the story of Jonah, except from the Bible. We read it, and we saw they repented. Mm -hmm. But we don't know how God, and Jonah didn't know, which is why he fled, how God was preparing the ground before he went. Did you know there was a plague? This, they were found, these cuneiform tablets, uh, talking about the ancient uh, Assyrian history. And they said there was a major plague three years before Jonah came. That was followed by a civil war. Maybe they were blaming each other for the plague in Nineveh. That was followed by another plague. Then, and NASA records this, it's one of the most famous eclipses in all of history called the Bersagel Eclipse. It happened, a total solar eclipse over Nineveh a month before Jonah came. Jonah comes and he says, repent. Well, that's why they were so willing to repent. They've already suffered from a major plague, a civil war, another plague, a total solar eclipse over Nineveh. And then here comes Jonah saying, you better repent. Now, obviously the solar eclipse, they didn't receive judgment because they repented. It didn't happen for a while. So just like I never set dates for anything, but what I do say is look at the events that happen on God's calendar so you know if it's God who's speaking or not. And then hopefully we repent and judgment is stayed. But I believe judgment, because it's falling at a low one over, and this is the first time a solar eclipse has ever gone over the entire United States and nowhere else in over 100 years. The last one was World War I, and guess what? It World was on, it was World War I. One, and it was on August 21st, the same as this one. Wow, wow. Somebody who is not even from a Jewish background, who poses himself as a messianic leader of some description, even though that, that is not even his, his background, ethnically or in terms of family or his religious upbringing. Mark Biltz, of course, was the Blood Moon's guru. Again, a big, ridiculous, crackpot joke that came to nothing. Well, Harold Camping died with egg all over his face, 
I expect Mark Biltz is still trying to scrape the egg from his face, and I only wish that World Net Daily and Joe Farah had not promoted such absurdity. But now we come to September 23rd, 2017, none other than William Papley, who says that the configuration of Virgo on the 23rd of September will be the fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 12, despite the fact that only nine will be stars, the other three will be planets. Astronomically, as we pointed out three weeks ago, it makes no sense. He is, of course, promoted by various evangelical preachers, such as Greg Laurer, Scott Clark, and Gary Ray. The more time that goes by, the more inclined I become to view William Tapley not only as a false prophet, but as someone who is laboring under some kind of delusion. I was alerted first by the personal display of pride and arrogance beaming from his videos and woven into his commentaries, and secondly, by his ability to see all and only the things that he wants to see. The symbology in the Denver airport videos are classic examples. But what really got my attention was the two-day warning video, Red Alert, World War III Imminent, serving a dual purpose of reminding us of his October 13th date for the start of World War III. In this video, I want to sum up the most important warning which I have given in all of my other videos, and that is that World War III is imminent. And also, it comes with a neatly packaged safety net statement. We can pray enough to postpone the start of World War III. Just in case things don't work out. I can't help but notice that he chooses to remind us of October 13th, just two days before. Was this to conveniently allow him to avoid the wave of response videos and comments, which would make it a rather permanent issue should the date fail? Good thing the wave of detraction videos never took place, because his October 13th war didn't either. I believe that even William Tapley is now doubting his own World War III by the end of 2010 prophecy, as the door on his original prediction window is rapidly closing. For over a year he's been touting his own timetable for the start of World War III. But now, as we approach the end of the line, he doesn't appear very sure of himself. On this program, I want to discuss the timing of World War III. That is, when will Barack Obama provoke Russia into attacking the United States? You need to prepare for World War III now, because it will occur within the next 20 months. That is, sometime between 2009 and 2010. World War III will occur at the beginning of the tribulation period. World War III should have begun on that date. It was scheduled to begin then. The start of tribulation is, of course, World War III. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't see much difference now that we have started the tribulation and before the tribulation began. The reason is, Jesus is shortening the days. Now, as I have been saying, the reason this is important is because you need to understand that the seven years of tribulation will be triggered by World War III. In other words, all the disasters which were scheduled to begin on October 13th, in other words, World War III, economic disaster, famine, martial law, and so on, those have been put off because Jesus is shortening the days as he promised. The fact is God has verified that the tribulation has begun. You need to understand that it is World War III that triggers the Great Tribulation. Now, I'm not a prophet, an eagle, nor a messenger of God, but you don't have to be a Jeremiah nor an Ezekiel to see what's coming next. So. I want to make a few predictions myself. 
first prediction? More videos. For those of you who are worried that William Tapley is probably done making videos, as he has indicated, fear not. Mr. Tapley is by no means finished making videos. What will these videos say? November 15th and November 29th. These are the big ones. Although now, according to the latest Third Eagle video, I think November 11th is the new gay Armageddon. Isn't that special? These are the last dates left for his original predictions for World War III to initiate. Of the four dates that he originally predicted, of October 13th and October 31st, have now passed by. What happens if November 11th, 15th, and 29th pass as the world somehow survives? Rest assured, William Tapley will be frantically combing through national and global events, trying to find the one thing which will provide the undeniable proof to the world that World War III is indeed imminent and that he was right all along. But reading the recent comments left on some of his latest videos, you can see that people who may have been followers of William Tapley are now starting to smell the problem. Once 2011 is underway, you can expect warnings detailing the latest event that will fit the prophecy mold as the trigger for the big war, real or imagined. Even if Mr. Tapley doesn't find a world occurrence that adequately solves the puzzle, he has demonstrated that he can retroactively claim fulfill prophecy, just like he did in the Chilean mining story. And remember, he doesn't need to be held to a committed date, because Jesus is shortening the days. And conveniently for Mr. Tapley, Jesus has not told us by how long. Well, we will see what happens on the 24th of September. I guarantee you, it will not be Revelation chapter 12. The woman will not flee to the wilderness. The church will not be raptured. The Antichrist will not sweep a third of the stars from heaven. It'll all be another big nothing. More of the boy who cried wolf syndrome. This week in prophecy, we will be seeing what happens next week in prophecy. Let's continue. The migrant crisis in Europe continues this week. Erdogan of Turkey, the Islamist, is complaining that the West has only taken 250,000. Most of these migrants in Greece coming to islands such as Lesbos, Germany or England as their ultimate des destination. A journalist went on an interviewing spree on the island of Lesbos. And one interviewee after another said that they're only there to get the benefits from the infidel because the infidels are easy to fool. And many made it clear that they see themselves as coming to Europe to Islamize Europe and to spread Sharia. Angela Merkel, of course, seems to want this to happen. She wants to bring in up to a million a year into Germany alone so the German taxpayer can support them. So more German women can be sexually assaulted. That seems to be her policy, her program, what she's aiming at doing. Why do you see such actions that can only be either insane or treasonous? Again, it is the judgment of God on a post-Christian, neo-pagan Western society, especially Europe. This week in prophecy, Sharon Nisikh, age 17, was murdered in Burrawala, Pakistan, for drinking from the same glass of water as the other students because he was a Christian, they were Muslims. They brutally murdered him. What if a Muslim student had been beaten to death in the West for drinking from the same glass as people professing to be Christians or Jews? What if a Muslim student was beaten to death in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago or Minneapolis or London? The world's media would be up in arms. 
But when it's a Christian being murdered, the world's media says nothing. So it continues. Israel has been deluged by refugees from Eritrea, most of them Christian, and some from Sudan. There are at present 40,000 that Israel has tried to absorb. You can see them working in hotels at Israeli resorts, such as in Eilat. Egypt will not take them, and many have been shot dead at the border trying to enter Egypt. Others have faced wholesale slaughter at the hands of Islamists and Afro-Arabs in Sudan. They're having a hard time getting anywhere. But Israel is a small country, a Jewish state that has taken in 40,000 black African Christians, but can take no more. It simply does not have the resources or the jobs to do so. It was thus announced this week that no more of these people would be given jobs and that they, if they did not leave the country as illegal immigrants, they would face arrest and prosecution. Israel is being forced to protect its borders. How much more can a little country like Israel do? It's taken 40,000 when the Arab countries won't take any of these Christians. In fact, it is Muslims who are driving these Christians into their status as asylum seekers. But that is the reality. These people can go to black African countries such as Rwanda and Uganda, however, and that is where they need to be heading. The situation has become highly exasperated in Africa this past week, with even more so-called Christian refugees arriving from southern Sudan into Uganda. Southern Sudan was created as a place of Christian refuge from their Islamic persecutors, but now the so-called Christians are fighting with each other. This is horrific. This is absolutely horrible. These countries in Africa railed against British and European colonialism. Compared to what they have now with their independence, it is much, much worse than anything that took place under the British or the Europeans. There seems to be no solution to this problem. None. A very sad situation indeed. But let's continue. The Baptist Union of the United Kingdom was a participant in the Greenbelt event, which is like a sort of music festival and a public picnic with camping and young people being drawn from around the UK and elsewhere into this major outdoor event that has been musically focused and focused on other issues. Only this year there is Muslim worship included. Can Greenbelt or the Evangelical Alliance of Great Britain, which has thus far not said anything, or the Baptist Union, which has participated, show me one place where Christian worship is included in a Muslim festival. They cannot. Yet they featured speakers on a variety of social issues, not the gospel. One was Clive Stafford Smith, a so-called human rights attorney who blasted America on the basis of human rights violations, but said nothing of the fact that of the 57 Islamic countries in the world, None will give Muslims the rights or freedoms. None, I'm sorry. None will give Christians the rights or freedoms that Muslims receive in the UK. Utter, utter hypocrisy. This is Greenbelt. This is the Baptist Union. Islamic worship at what had been supposedly an evangelical Christian fellowship. This week in prophecy. The story continues. The former Israeli defense minister, Moshe 
Yalon, who had been chief of staff of the Israeli military, was fired some time ago by Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, in a seemingly act of political retaliation, Moshe Yalon has called for the resignation of Mr. Netanyahu over what is known as Case 3000, a criminal prosecution of which Mr. Netanyahu is not even a suspect. Again, politically motivated prosecutions, the same as we see in the United States. You can't win at the ballot box, try to invoke the power of the courts. Melanie Phillips, the British journalist, has done an excellent article on the recent research of Dove Fisher, a law professor, showing a dichotomy among American Jews and American Jewish opinion. It tends to be conservative and orthodox Jews who are politically conservative or who will lean towards the Republican Party or Libertarian Party or conservatism. While mainstream left-wing Jews, representing nearly three-quarters or approximately three-quarters of American Jews, are becoming increasingly alienated from, and in many cases, opposed to Israel. Shockingly, the Israel History Center in New York has appointed as its new director a virtually anti-Zionist Jewish director-president. It's getting to the point where the enemies of the Jewish people are other Jews. Now, we've warned about people like Desi, Debbie Washerman Schultz and Charles Schumer for some time. But it's getting to the point now where some of the biggest opponents of Israel's security are left-wing North America. Jews. It's quite a thing. Ben Shapiro, who is an Orthodox Jew who leans politically to the right, was finally allowed to speak just last evening at Berkeley University. So free speech winning out at UC Berkeley last night. Ben Shapiro was allowed to speak amid a massive security price tag. $600,000 for security. Doesn't that seem a little excessive? They were all, of course, concerned about Antifa violence, which we have seen in force in recent episodes there. Protests were still held. There were nine arrests made, but the radical, violent anti-fascists were not around to stop the event. Here are some highlights of what Ben Shapiro did get to say last night in Berkeley. Watch. Thank you to the morons who put up that sign across the way and says, we say no to your white supremacist <laughs> Well, I say thank you because I also say no to white supremacist <laughs> And if you stick around long enough in this speech, you will hear me do exactly that. Thanks to Antifa and the supposed anti-fascist brigade for exposing what the radical left truly is, all of America is watching because you guys are so stupid. It's horrifying, I am grateful, and you can all go to hell, you pathetic, lying, stupid jackasses. As far as the idea I'm a white supremacist, you see the thing on the top of my head, right? This funny hat, it's called a yarmulke. Hey, white supremacists aren't that fond of it, which is why I was, according to the Anti-Defamation League, the number one recipient of white supremacist anti-Semitism on the internet among journalists in 2016. But no, I'm a white supremacist now. Because this is the way the left works, right? If you don't agree with them, everyone's a white supremacist. The reason that I am here is because fascism does not own this university. Because there are students who do want to hear differing views, who don't believe that the First Amendment should die under the jackboots and Birkenstocks of a bunch of anarchist communist pieces of garbage. Here now an exclusive, Ben Shapiro, editor-in-chief of DailyWire.com. Ben, good to see you tonight, um, and good to see some of what, what happened in there. Um, do you think that, you know, any of the Antifa folks or people who were, you know, very much against what you were there to do, were they inside the arena? Could you sense that? Uh, well, I don't think they were inside the arena. What we were told by the police is that there may have been Antifa members in the crowd, but they weren't actually going to reveal themselves because what the, there, were, there were actual rules on the books that the cops were now enforcing that if you put a mask down, they were going to arrest you 
immediately. So the way Antifa yeah. works is they like to infiltrate civilian crowds. They pop out, they put on their mask, they do something violent, they pop back into the crowd, and then they disappear. That's how they work. The cops weren't having any of that last night. This was really a tribute to the UCPD and the Berkeley PD mm -hmm. for doing their jobs. When they do their jobs, when there's law and order, free speech can happen at Berkeley. When they don't, Antifa reigns. There were some arrests. Let's put up the pictures of the mud, the mug shots uh, that were out there earlier, and I know you tweeted about these young folks as well. There they are. There they are. Smiling young folks um, who, who got arrested, I think, for having some kind of weapon on them. I don't know if it was a brick or, you know, it didn't, it didn't exactly describe it, but, but there they are. What do you think? And the best that life has to offer. I mean, obviously, this is, this is the cream of America. Uh, apparently, some were arrested for having signs that had sticks on the back of them. Uh, one person was arrested for having uh, some sort of baton in his backpack. Uh, one was arrested for spitting on a police officer. So uh, the idea that if, if the police hadn't been there, there would have been violence, I think that's probably true, given the fact that all of Berkeley was basically shut down. Yeah. I mean, there were businesses shutting early yesterday. Uh, there were The Bank of America actually boarded up its own ATMs because they were concerned that Antifa was going to destroy the ATMs again. Uh, Antifa, again, they, they've been led by the city to believe that they rule the city. And last night was the first time that the, the police were actually allowed to engage in a show of force saying you don't rule the city. And if you try to, try to violate the law, we'll arrest you. I mean, the, I talked to a bunch of police officers yesterday. They were really, really happy that for the first time, the leftist administration at Berkeley and in the city of Berkeley allowed them to do their jobs. Well, maybe, maybe they figured out how to do this. And maybe you helped them to get there. I know there's a bunch of speakers, um, including Steve Bannon and Ann Coulter, who are scheduled to speak there in coming weeks so we'll see if you know maybe they've they've learned how to how to make this work I, I want to ask you one quick question about the ESPN thing uh, as well um, because today there was an internal memo that was leaked and let's put some of it up on the screen um, by the leadership at, uh, at ESPN okay um, the ESPN president in a memo to staff said that ESPN is about sports it is not a political organization and obviously that was in reference to Jamelia Hill the um, <laughs> woman who said that uh, the president's a white supremacist what do you think it's absurd of course ESPN is a political organization I've been calling them MSNBC with footballs for years because that's basically what they are you can't turn on a broadcast on ESPN without getting 45 minutes about the wonders of Colin Kaepernick or the heroism of Caitlyn Jenner mm -hmm. so for that I mean they fired Mike Ditka and Kurt Schilling basically for saying things that were mildly right-wing the, the idea they're not political is just absurd by the way I think that Jamel Hill should keep her job because I think that as long as ESPN is going to be overtly political uh, with Jamel Hill I think they should hire back Ditka I think they should hire back Schilling uh, the, the, the whole thing is ridiculous us. Do you think the pressure on this making any difference? The president tweeted about it as well. So, you know, is, is that why this memo was produced or is it just lip service? Well, I, I do think that over the past few months, there's been a lot of pressure on ESPN to demonstrate that they're not a partisan political hack network, but that's what they are. And it's not really working very well. As far as the president, I mean, I, I really don't think the government ought to be getting involved in telling private corporations how to, how to run themselves. All right, Ben, thank you very much. Good to see you. What had once been a free speech movement is now an anti-free speech movement. Now it is notable as prophetically important for the following reasons. It is orthodox Jews who lean politically to the right and to the right of center. It is secular Jews who generally lean to the left. We see what kind of Jews are going to be in power in Israel. It is all adding up. It is all coming together. There is a battle both in Israel and the United States, not only in terms of religious philosophy among Jews, but in terms of their political correlations, in terms of party affiliation and ideology. This is very, very significant from a prophetic perspective. This week in prophecy, has in many respects resembled some of the things that have happened over the last few months. Except that the momentum is being gained from today's terrorist attack in London to North Korea now having an intercontinental missile capacity and the detonation of an experimental hydrogen bomb things that would have been unimaginable a few years ago, but have been allowed to happen. It seems every week that goes by, the situation becomes more and more traumatic. How much longer can it continue? 
We will see on the 24th of September a day in which it is not likely anything of any major significance is going to happen that will even vaguely remember or resemble Revelation chapter 12. Again, this Mr. Tapley will be proven to be another crackpot, just like Harold Camping and Mark Biltz. Another crackpot. But Satan will raise up these crackpots one after another so that when something really does happen, as we've been warning, it'll be the boy who cried wolf. People will just think it's another crackpot sounding a false alarm. And so it continues. That has been this week in prophecy. In the United States, it's quite an issue. Mr. Trump, who was forced to run against not only the Democratic Party, but the Republican Party establishment, has been opposed tooth and nail by establishment Republicans from day one. John McCain, Susan Collins, Jeff Flakey, Mr. Corker, Mr. Boehner, obviously the Bush dynasty, and above all, Mr. Ryan and Mr. McConnell. It's become so desperate that he's making deals with the Democrats, his avowed enemies. We have two parties who are good for nothing and are bad for America. No matter what you think of Mr. Trump, and I'm very disappointed in many of the things he has done and failed to do, but I realize the realities he's facing when your own party is a party of treachery and liars. Please pray for him and for Mr. Pence. Please keep them in your prayers. And we continue to urge prayer for the salvation of people like Ben Shapiro and other Jewish conservatives. They've seen through the political lie. Now they need to see through the religious deception in which they are immersed. Please also pray for believers in Muslim and Arab countries. Their plight is not a pleasant one, but the mainstream media will say and do nothing on their behalf. An interesting film appeared on the internet this week in Prophecy. It was a film showing and documenting that in the last four years, over $1 billion provided by Europe and the United States, mainly, oh, <coughs> over $1 billion of American taxpayer and European taxpayer dollars were spent by the Palestinian Authority to financially reward suicide bombers, terrorists, and their families. That is our money. Please, Mr. Trump, stop funding them. One note. Finally, one country, that country being Norway, has pulled the plug. But why wasn't it the United States leading the way, or Great Britain? It is time to pull the financial plug on the Palestinian Authority. They are no better than Hamas or Hezbollah, and the House of Saud, the Salafists, are no better than the Iranians. Let us face the realities for what they are. Yes, there are moderate Muslims, but if there is moderate Islam, please show me where it exists. One country, just one where Christians get the rights that Muslims get in America, Britain, or the West. Another scandal in Great Britain. Not surprisingly, the Church of England. On the Isle of Man, in a Church of England school, a six-year-old was confused by the fact that a classmate was coming to school one day dressed as a boy and another as a girl. 
in what is supposedly a Christian school. It is under the control of the Anglican Bishop of the Isle of Man. This Anglican Bishop has been quite a fellow in the past. When Islamic terrorists perpetrated terrorist bombings of trains in Spain, he made it his business to go to a mosque, not to present the gospel message of Jesus, but to express solidarity with Muslims. Basically apologetic for the way that people were associating the terror with Islam, even though the terrorists carried out the attacks in the name of Islam. And now, of course, he will not do anything about this issue of transgenderism among children aged six in Anglican schools on the Isle of Man. The best thing the Church of England can do for England is to drop dead. It is already spiritually, morally, and theologically dead. No born-again Christian is going to bring revival to it. They're only going to compromise with a wickedness from hell. No Christian should support it financially or otherwise. Come out of her, my people, does not only apply to Rome. It applies to the Presbyterian Church of America. It applies to the World Council of Churches. It applies increasingly to the Baptist Union, and not least of all, to the Church of England in England. <clears throat> the bishop may not believe Romans chapter 1, but he will one day. These are children. A mess has been this week in prophecy. The Lord is indeed coming. As always, let us lift up our head when we see these things taking place. For our redemption draweth near. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you. And please keep President Trump in prayer.